All right. Hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday and happy holidays to everyone. It is officially the holidays. Today is a day that I am, uh, in a word, excited about, but also I think just full disclosure, I this is a friend of mine. This is someone that I care about that um, you know, is, is a meaningful human being in the Valley to me. And I couldn't be more thrilled to share with you her wine and her story today. And so we are talking about Harvest Duhigg. Yes, that is her last name on the bottle. Her first name is in fact Harvest. And you may have caught the wine in 60 seconds that I put up here probably back in the summertime, but I just couldn't love this woman more. I couldn't love her wines more and all that she does. And I think that you are going to love her as well, which is why I have invited her on here to talk because she is just such such a breath of fresh air and sort of when I describe her I think of her as like you know a cooler hipper version of mother earth and she is just someone that is not only a, a talented winemaker but just someone that you kind of want to be friends with right and I think at the end of the day for me this is exactly the kind of people whose wines I want to be drinking and supporting so I hope you all agree with me there um for those of you who don't know uh Harvest Duhigg didn't read the little blurb I put below no problem that's what we're here for Harvest Duhigg has been a winemaker at Camus for about 20 years now uh she has been a pivotal part of that production so if you love Camus um and I know so many of you do this is going to be a wine for you to watch. In fact, James Molesworth of Wine Spectator noted that this uh, this particular wine and, and Harvest's uh, endeavors are, um, it was a strong debut and won a Napa Cabernet to watch. So strong words from him. Of course, for me, you know, this meeting Harvest, seeing what she's been doing, I met her in 2017, uh, right after the fires actually, because she was managing a vineyard up on Atlas Peak that, um, you know, sort of uh, part of that initial, um, the, those initial fires in 2017. So I went up there with her to check things out and that's where we met. I, I have stayed friends with her ever since. She helped me with a little project of mine uh, on the wine front and I've just enjoyed getting to know her, but her her journey is an interesting one. This is her own personal project. She does still work at KMS. She is still a winemaker for them. She is also doing this, but her last name Duhigg is a rather famous one in Napa Valley. This is a generational family that's been around for years. In fact, if you drive around, uh, I think it's around like the Carneros area, you'll see there's a Duhigg road, but the Duhigg's, uh, you know, famous for farming. Her, her husband is in the agriculture business. I think really more on like the tractor side of things. She could fill you on that. Um, but Harvest has an actual vineyard on her property. So her, you know, what I would consider like her homestead, um, that is where she farms and grows her grapes for her wine. She only makes one wine. It's all Cabernet Sauvignon and it's from the region of Coombsville, which is, you know, the southern, uh, not the southernmost, but a southern Appalachian in, in Napa Valley is sort of on the eastern side there. Really special place, kind of a place that I've talked about a little bit because it's, you know, more, I, I hesitate to use the term up and coming because it's been around for so long. And of course, um, famous pioneers have loved that place for years, sort of on the underground side of things. But it is where a lot of winemakers are flocking to um, because they love how cool the AVA is, not just in stature, but also in temperature. It tends to be a little bit on the cooler side compared to the rest of the valley. So we can definitely talk about that with her. She um, is going to be joining us from the vineyard. So she'll, I'm sure, talk about what is going on there. She's got plenty to say on that front. Um, and we'll talk about the wine itself. I do just kind of want to give a little tasting note of these wines. So this is the 2017, 2016 is the vintage that um, I first fell in love with. That was her first vintage. And one of the things that I love so much about this wine is I love selling it at press. This was absolutely one of my favorites to recommend to people, especially ones that came in and they would sit down and I would talk to them and they'd say, say oh, our favorite wine is Camus. And immediately I'd be like, well, you have to try Duhigg because I think to some extent there are some through lines between Camus and Duhigg, but this wine definitely has a signature all of its own. And I think it's a wine that, you know, speaks to the, the same audience that loves Camus, but it's something altogether unique. So um, this is actually the first that I've tried the 17s. I kind of saved it for you guys so I could do it on camera. I'm very familiar with the 16s. Like I said, I sold tanker loads of it at press, but I'm excited to try 17, which as you may remember, as I mentioned, um, you know, some fires that had happened, but really, really late in the season. So um, not a horribly affected vintage in the way of 
uh, smoke taint that we're seeing, you know, in some other vintages, um, maybe in 2020, but uh, that all remains to be seen. Um, the 17 vintage was largely characterized by very, uh, very warm growing season, especially towards the latter part. So some heat spikes that happened. And so you got some pretty ripe fruit out there. So Coombsville, I'm excited to see how the freshness uh, stayed, um, because I think that is a place that, you know, can tolerate heat in a way that maybe the rest of the valley can't. But right off the bat, I mean, I'm seeing really nice dark, dark color. Um, it's jumping out of the glass already. So that's a really, really good sign. And I'm just getting so much cassis and like a freshness. Like there's something like chalky that's coming out right now. Mm. Really, really dark profiled fruit. You know, it's interesting. The 16, I kind of remember being more on the red side. This is definitely leaning on the more like purpley black side. And there is a little bit of this uh, sort of um, black licorice, fernet, more fernet branca, more of that like tree herbs than the anisette, which I, I'm really, really loving. And I think is also a little bit more hallmark of Coopsville. Mm. There is a soft, soft suppleness to this wine and it's easy and it's approachable and it wants to be drunk right, right, right now. Not to say that it can't age, but man, are those tannins really, really silky, silky smooth. What is incredible about this, one is the finish because I'm still tasting it, but two is how plush that it feels, but it also like really, really light at the same time. It's really, really lifted and bright and fresh. Mm. Tasty, tasty. I think 17 actually might be better than the 16. I think it's definitely more a complete wine. I love the intensity of the fruit. I love how focused it is. I love the depth of it. Um, and I just love the finish. It just won't quit. My goodness. All right. Well, I guess we'll find out why that is. If you guys have questions, uh, we will be streaming via Zoom. So she won't be able to see them, but I'll be able to see them and I will relay them to her. So I'm going to bring it, bring her in. She's in the waiting room right now. So don't be alarmed. Let's see if I can make this happen. I think I can. I have faith in myself. Admit. All right. Let's see. I think we're doing it. We did it. We're there. She's connecting to Adi and I'm still going to drink because this is delicious. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So, so happy with this wine. Wow. Mm. Hello, beautiful harvest. Hello. Oh my I'm goodness. So it's so nice to be with you today. It's so nice to be with you. I haven't seen your face in a million years. It feels like. Oh, and all of 2020, at least. <laughs> right? We did, little, we did do a little tasting together, but that was, that also feels like a million years ago, but you look like you're in your happy yeah, place right seriously. now. Where are you? Oh my goodness. You've nailed it. I am here at Duhigg Vineyards, kind of doing my after work work, uh, which seems to be never ending, but um, it's actually a really awesome time to be here because it's really quiet and you can see the energy shift from how busy we were throughout the growing season and then with harvest to having a little more time to be a little more contemplative about um, approaching winter, which is pruning mm. and um, laying the groundwork for 2021 is really what it is. So we've already come into the vineyard and laid compost and a little bit of amendments to plan for winter rain to bring them down into that soil profile. And now I've just been walking out here doing some pruning samples. So I want to take advantage of making, um, you know, the vine by vine approach to what's best out here in the vineyard. Just really what is awesome. what does pruning sample mean? I don't know what that means. This, uh, ooh, so what that means is I come through um, before I have um, any anybody with me. And can you see my vine right here, mm -hmm. where I'm at? I mm -hmm. come through and I look at the the shoots where they grew last year. And sometimes the shoot growth is a little bit um, inconsistent from spot to spot. So some shoots might have a little bit thicker girth and some might be a little smaller. And on anything that we feel might be a little small and need next year's energy to really uh, get that growth stronger, I will leave like just one bud and then take off last year's growth completely. That way that one bud will grow and produce a stronger position, which is, you know, inevitably always what we want is to select the positions that grow really consistently, really evenly, um, you know, our style wine. 
I so I go it. through and I, I just do the pruning just like okay. so. And till I get down sort of what I feel like the vine, the vineyard needs on the whole, then we'll come in with um, a few more helping hands and get everybody's pruning. So we like to do that once we know the vines are like full rest mode, they are mm. completely asleep and all the energies left the shoots and gone back down to the roots, but we're getting very close. And I can see that because all these little positions that I just pruned are dry, which means they're not actively pushing um, water or sugar, which is cool, it's a place to be. They're going to sleep now. They are going <laughs> night night. I would like to go night night for all of 2020 at this point, right? <laughs> I'm ready for I winter. Think everybody would. We're ready for winter. We're ready for a bottle of wine that just like knocks us out and we wake up and we're like, oh, here we are, it's all over. Um, but you, so you're at your, so at your vineyard, which is in Coombsville, mm. right? Um, and yeah, how so often are you, how often are you out there? Cause you're, you're out there pretty much every day, right? Yeah. I mean, our vineyard's at our home, so it's a great place to have the bird's eye view over what's going on. Um, and you know, I manage the vineyard myself. So I come out during the season at different times, you know, sometimes it's a lot, like from the time we have bloom, which is when the little clusters when they're in their infancy actually open up and flower but from that time on we get busy and that usually for us here is about the late March early April um, and then we're coming through pretty often once a week it's kind of our family tradition that if it's warm and the sunset's gorgeous like we're just walking around out here because it gives us a chance to take a look like are there new gopher mounds <laughs> is there a gopher problem we need to <laughs> take a look at you know has has anybody nested in the in the grapevines which is something that's fun to kind of watch is um, how integrated nature can be out in a vineyard. Oh, look, we have a visitor. Oh, hey. This is Juna. <laughs> oh, hi, Juna. There is, YouTube loves animals, so Juna can stay as, as long as well, Juna lives. <laughs> well, I don't, have a, I don't have a choice because she is <laughs> um, dominant vineyard dog at the moment. So if I'm is out this, here, she's out here. I'm in. Is this the dog who knocked over my wine glass when I was Go hanging ahead. out with you? No, that was my border collie, Lulu, who oh, well, I'm sure make an appearance Lulu. during our conversation. <laughs> but I tend to be, I tend to be like the Pied Piper of animals. And all of a sudden I'll have, you'll see cats in the background. Like they just can't stand to be missing any action out here. It's because your mother earth harvest. This is like your, your lot in life is just <laughs> to be one with, one with all the nature and the animals. You know, my mom, I think had some foresight because uh, she named me Harvest and I was mm -hmm. born reared in Napa Valley and she had nothing to do with the wine business, but she was very strongly tied to her Native American heritage and uh, guided me along those principles exactly that we are all one part of the universe. So um, that is what guided me here. I, I found viticulture, not from, like I said, not from having it in my family, but, but because I love to grow a garden. And at 16, yeah. I had a full garden for as long as I can remember after that. And then that's how I found my way to growing grapevines. I was like, well, Harvest, what could you possibly do <laughs> um, in Napa and find some happiness? And that was always what I went after. So viticulture is uh, what I landed on after swimming for several months in the ocean. I popped up out of the ocean one day in Maui and was like, that's it, Eureka. I had a Eureka moment. <laughs> but do, I love that you I don't know if you I, I don't know Amanda if I've ever um talked to you about Duhigg and where John's family originated from and how they landed in Napa Valley I don't think you have we've just talked about so, the fact that they're like they're generational Duhigg. and I've always seen Duhigg Road yeah, so the Duhigs came from Ireland originally, and they settled on the East Coast just outside of Martha's Vineyard. Um, but then 1853, somebody struck out with a bright idea that they were going to take a wagon train across the country. And they got to Napa Valley before Napa Valley was even Napa Valley, it was just the Napa Territory. And they settled on like 450 acres of land that John's great great grandfather bought from General Vallejo and his wife, Benicia. And they own that land for many generations um, up until I think the 1940s when uh, their life, you know, life changed. There wasn't a lot of Duhigg um, siblings and children and they moved into town. And so they had 
all those years been farmers and ranchers and there's a long history and his grandfather um, wrote a couple books and diaries talking about their early life as being ra uh, ranchers and grape growers. And it was really cool because um, I found one of the USDA um, articles that featured the doohigs and it had the um, year's total of Zinfandel that they had grown and that they had won a special award for producing apricots. And wow. so it was really cool to be able to come back all these years later and um, build something of our own from scratch in a place that we made our own home in Coombsville and really live on with John's family's heritage. I love that. And, and Coombsville is so special. And I know you, you farm um, or you manage some, some other vineyards up and down the valley, but talk to me about Coombsville a little bit and why this particular place sort of resonates with mm. you and with your wines. So we bought the land originally just to own property and like raise a family in the country and have a big garden and have chickens and kind of have a little full sustainable model and vineyards came along with that idea just that the timing was a little later. But what we thought was really insanely special about Coombsville is um, we sit at the toe slope of uh, the Eastern Ridgeline in Napa Valley, which is the Atlas Peak Ridge, which means we have a lot of uh, very light volcanic soils. And I, from my experience, know that volcanic soils to me produce just these amazing texturous wines. We have a little bit of elevation. We sit about 180 feet above sea level, which gives us a beautiful, gentle south and southwest slope. Um, our soils are very shallow, shy bearing. And I, was, I brought out this jar to show you guys a little deeper layer that I dug out earlier. And that is what some people call tufa, which is like a volcanic ash. Mm -hmm. Is my I've done some study and research, and we really believe that it's diatoms. And if you dig down in here, we've actually, in these bits, it's not clay, they're very light, they're, they're fracturable, they crumble in your hand. And we found fragments of seashell and fossils in here, which has been really enlightening. This has like no water bearing, no water holding capacity. Mm -hmm. So the water just kind of drains right through just like volcanic rock, right? And um, what that gives us the ability to do is produce really small vines um, that we can control the vigor on and that have the capacity to produce these beautiful full canopies, but then put a lot of resources towards cluster ripening. And in Coombsville, mm. where we sit, it's believed that um, we sit in this old sunken caldera, which is like the side of a volcano that blew out millions of years ago. Um, and we're seeing signs that yes, that is true. We believe that that's why this site is really unique um, because of that. And it's very cool. So we get, you know, the classic maritime Napa Valley influence, which means the fog rolls in and it rolls out. But for us in Coonsville, we tend to not burn off until like 9.30 or 10 o'clock, which means um, we have mm. a lot cooler time uh, than say anywhere north of us past Oakville or St. Helena, where it's a little warmer and brighter. And that lends itself its own set of characteristics to the wine, which we think when you integrate the environmental factors plus the soil, we just love what we're producing here. Well, it's delicious. And I have to say, you know, compared to the 16, this is a totally different animal. And I don't know um, necessarily why that is. And I won't say totally different. It's not a total departure, but I will say I, I find this particular wine versus the 16, which I felt was like much more red fruited and more like strawberry. This is leaning more towards um, like purpley fruits. So more into that cassis and like even some blackberry as well. But what I love so much, and I keep going back to this, so I will be probably toasted in about 22 seconds, um, is how fresh it is. And I think that sort of speaks to Coombsville, right? Like you can have all of this texture and all of this liveness and the ethereal quality of the fruit, which is, you know, fleshy and bouncy and, and delicious and, and, and quaffable. But then there's this lift, there's this freshness to it that makes you want to keep coming back for more. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that it just seems very Coombsville and it seems like, you know, very much your style of winemaking, especially from that vineyard in Coombsville. Um, I think you kind of nailed it. And it's interesting to hear your perspective because I too think that the two vintages have some distinct differences, but that's what I love about what we're doing is mm -hmm. in general winemaking, you're at the hand of mother nature, right? I mean, every vintage gives you slightly different growing season, uh, growing conditions. And so 
we're making the best decisions in the vineyard in real time to um, produce what we think is going to make the best wine. But inevitably, there's going to be these little nuances and differences from vintage to vintage, which I think is pretty cool. I think the seam for me that carries things um, consistently through is texture and tannin, and especially texture and tannin from, um, from this location. And so um, the fruit component, I think, may be subtly different, but that's kind of what keeps us all interested. Yeah. No, I think, I think texture leave, this is very much the same wine and I'm pouring myself more, which means I definitely like it. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing. I, <laughs> I, I think for me, you know, what, it, what the hallmark of this wine is, is the texture and the lift. So that plushiness, the softness, you know, it feels, I loved, I, I reread today the, um, there was a quote that I think came out in that wine spectator article that like, you don't buy a dress and put it on the hanger to wear four years later, like that you want to buy it now and drink it now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of love that quote. And I think, you know, these wines yeah. though, though they will age beautifully. I do think that they're, you know, I just popped it right now, right before, and I saved it. I didn't actually drink it before this. Cause I kind of wanted my natural mm -hmm. real reaction to be on camera. But I think for me, I just get you know, so much freshness and so much lift, but it is so drinkable right now in a, in a great way. And I think it's, it's something that you don't really see very often, you know, often these approachable wines earlier in their youth don't have the lift and the brightness and the freshness and sort of that, that cleaning up factor that you have with this wine. A lot of times if they're approachable so young, um, you know, they can be a little like soupy and gloppy, but this, this is not the case. This is like mm. painfully good right now. Well, thank you. I don't want to be soupy and guapy. I want to you be are not soupy and guapy. You're the opposite of soupy and guapy in fashion. <laughs> Deliver. <laughs> but talk something that I think making a wine that's ready to drink upon release maybe is a simple statement to make, but I think it really comes from farming first and um, really paying attention to what we're doing and how we treat the land and how we pay attention to the vines on kind of a like um, precision basis. And, you know, mm -hmm. I've really learned, I really learned a lot of all of that really in practice, um, from Chuck at KMS and he's, um, utmost hands down one of the best farmers that I can even think of. And so, uh, I feel very fortunate to, to be working there alongside him for all these years in the vineyards, cause it's taught me a lot. And so applying my knowledge here on this site, we've made mistakes. You know, I mean, there's been a, there's been some little hitches along the way. And, and I think that that's made us stronger and smarter and um, making better decisions in the future. So speaking of the future, one of the exciting things at our ranch is we are very close to the planning phase being ended and the development phase being started for like another four and a half acres. And at that point, our, um, our entire property will have all the vineyard it'll ever have but in totality someday it will be seven acres which is amazing for us wow that's awesome congratulations that's a mm -hmm. that's not an easy mm -hmm. thing to do in Napa Valley and for I'm sure for some people they're like what do you mean just plant vines like no it's not how it works in Napa it's like a whole thing <laughs> <sighs> it's a whole thing believe me but um no it's it's good to have the goal set it's good to look at what the future might hold um you know, part of our vineyard life also is having the diversity of other things that we grow. So um, we have spent a lot of time growing excess in our garden, um, kale, potatoes, carrots, I mean, geez, you name it. And I think we've, we've grown it and anything that's outside of what our family and friends will let us doorbell ditch on their door. Um, we take to the Napa Valley Food Bank, which has been an outstanding um, resource to our community and helping people with food scarcity. So that's one of the big bangs to using some of our um, plantable land as well. I love that. And I, I, you've always been such a, you know, big, a big, but like quiet part of the community. I think someone that, you know, does a lot of good and you don't make a big stink at, about it, but you just, you just kind of do the good things. Um, you've lived in Napa Valley for how many years now? Well, you grew up here, right? You grew up in the Valley. My whole life, yeah. Your whole life. <laughs> Born yeah. and raised. So um, I, um, what, my whole life. What do you, so I, yeah, born and raised. I took is, a little time. No, go ahead. I knew you were in Hawaii for a little bit, right? I was going to say you broke up just for a second. And I think there was a lag. So you go ahead. Mm. 
No, I, w- I was going to ask, you know, growing up in the Valley, I don't know if you see it as much as I do, but there is like such as a spirit of community in this place, probably more so than anywhere else I've ever lived. And, and I don't know if you notice that from since you've been there for forever, but um, do you feel that way? Oh, I, I hands down feel that way. And I think when you're active in the community, um, you definitely feel that sense of community. So for example, you know, our kids participate in 4-H and raising animals. And then that builds one little, you know, branch of our sort of communal family tree. And Mm. as you are engaged in those different aspects of your community, you realize how amazing and supportive and intertwined um, a lot of the members here are, which to me, I probably take for granted, Amanda, more than anything, because I don't know any different. Like I've never Mm. spent a lot of time away from here to know, be immersed in some other community to know if it's like that or not. So um, I feel pretty, pretty honored to say, yeah, I feel like that's who we are. And that's a really ingrained and, you know, when our community has experienced a lot of uh, trauma and tragedy, it's like everyone just rallies and figures out what we need to do to help one another. Yeah. Hey, no, it's, didn't I tell you a cat true. would be joining us? Yeah, uh, you did. Um, and <laughs> that was, I saw the cat walk in. I was like, oh, there it is. She's, she's calling all the animals. And ma- man, it is so beautiful where you are right now. It's just like, the sun looks like it's just starting to get to that golden hour. Everything looks just like so mm-hmm. pretty and, and that perfect like shade of yellow and orange and red. And um, this is your, so we're drinking the 17, which is your current release and you're sold out of the 16, right? Which is your first vintage? Correct. 16, 16 sold out, which was a blessing. 17, we released 17 in August and it's cruising, Amanda. I'm really, really happy. It's cruising along. Um, And we're really that um, it's available, that people are trying it that have never tried it before um, and getting it into the hands and on the tables of of, uh, everybody who loves anything about being a small producer, um, let alone being kind of a hands-on farmer. So yeah, I'm really excited. So good stuff. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone could extrapolate out from the fact that you said adding another four acres would put you at, what did you say? Seven. So you're dealing with what, three mm-hmm. acres and change right now. Um, which means you're making yep. how much, how much wine there's, I mean, it's just so small. It is so small. Um, it's kind of hard to say, so I don't, I don't bottle everything that that um, I produce, I'm producing, Mm. you know, the best of the best of, of the barrels. Mm. Um, So I was, you know, a slow and steady wins the race. So we've opened our 2016 with a small amount. 2017 is a little more 2018 will be a little bit more, but it's all of what I grow and produce here. I love that. And you, I love that you tend it to everything yourself. It's, it's your family property. It's your thing. It's your baby. I mean, as much as we can say, you know, you've got, an incredible resume. And I think, you know, people definitely, like I said, in my Instagram post today, like people may get through the door by way of KMS and knowing that you're a winemaker at KMS. But I think, you know, once they're through there and seeing the signature that you have with this wine and how delicious it is and refreshing, and it's something all um, completely different. There is such a singular nature about this that I think will resonate with people that will be completely different from everything else that you do. And, um, I'm so, I feel so lucky that I, I met you when I did and I get to enjoy these wines and I, I don't know, I feel like in some part, like I've been a part of this process. Like we had these wines at press, they were my favorite <laughs> wines to sell. Um, anytime they were in a, t- I used to love pointing it out to Chuck when he was in the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anytime he was there, I would point, you know, in the corner, like, Hey, there's a bottle of do And ch- this is um, Chuck Wagner for anyone who's like, who you're talking about, Chuck Wagner, he owns, owns KMS. Um, and, and, uh, he used to frequent the rest frequent press quite often, but, um, Anytime I'd have a bottle of your wine uh, on a table, I would point it out and be like, hey, harvest this wine, it's over there. <laughs> and you would get so excited. Oh, that's so awesome. See, that's the, like, to me, that's one of the most coolest things about growing grapes and making wine is this, is this sense of um, ex- extended family. Mm-hmm. Like you and I met at a really weird time in Napa Valley, right? It was right after yep. the 2017 fires. Yep. Um, and then we got thrown into a couple other fun things that we got to do and run around and check out vineyards and, yeah. you know, do a bunch of punch downs by hand and really get <laughs> our hands dirty. And so building that relationship is like forging a friendship in no other way, like that I've ever experienced before. And that happens in this environment, um, you know, fairly often. 
So yeah. I feel just as blessed, honestly, to be uh, in your acquaintance as well. Um, and I, and I do feel like this wine is, is retails at $125 a bottle, um, which might put some people off, but we really feel like the precision approach, hands-on farming that we're doing ourselves on this land, um, and the quality in which the wine, uh, um, demonstrates is kind of sets it apart. So we know it may not be for everybody, but we do hope to uh, grow organically our wine family and um, its experiences every single day that having the wine really is what builds that family. And, and to me, um, I think wine should be integrated on all levels every day. And mm -hmm. I know sometimes you get caught in the like, I'm going to save this bottle for a special occasion. And right now more than any time you know I realized like right now is a special occasion like I'm grateful I'm healthy I'm grateful I'm happy I'm grateful I'm working I'm grateful that I'm able to be here with you and do these tastings from here so <laughs> salute like pull, pull the cork out enjoy the moment and make right now that special occasion I couldn't agree more I will cheers to that and mm -hmm. um I think for anyone watching if if you're not in love with harvest you know you have no heart but um <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my gosh or sense of humor but um I <laughs> you know I thank you so much for for I know this was like sort of a challenge to join me from the vineyard but I did feel like it was important for people to see you in your element which you so clearly are right now in the vines surrounded by your animals with your wine <laughs> <laughs> because this is I think it speaks to this wine it speaks to what Duhigg is it speaks to the fact that this is boutique it's small there is a human and and several humans at that behind this wine that is mm -hmm. your family um, you know, they're $125. No, not in an expensive bottle of wine, but you know, there's a reason that this wine is what it is. And it's because your heart and your soul and your family goes into this. And, and it's something that you do every day and you live and breathe it. And, you know, this is a, a liquid expression of that. And how lucky are we to get to share in that with you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Yes. I, I love that. It. Well, and here we are. Here we are in that beautiful landscape right now. I'm so jealous right now. I'm still on the East Coast. I've got to get back soon. Um, oh, and our, <laughs> our and our Wi-Fi cooperated for us, so we're like I all the know. stars aligned. It was how big, lucky, beautiful thing. I love it. Well, for those who are, are unfamiliar with with Duhig, I did link below in the description, and be sure to get on her mailing list. Um, buy the wines when it feels right for you. This is definitely something that I feel privileged to have known about at the early side of things because I think it's only an upward trajectory from here. Um, but, you know, get on the mailing list. I think, you know, you send, when you send an email, um, it's a good one. And I think, you know, it's something that you should be paying attention to if you love wine and you love story and you love harvest, but you, let's be honest, who doesn't? Um, oh. So thank you so much. I will let you get back to your many, many tasks that I'm sure you have because you're a busy lady that, you know, officially has two jobs. Um, in addition to being a, a mother and a <laughs> wife and a, a guardian to animals. Um, but enjoy the rest of your evening. I will enjoy the rest of my wine. And to those of you who watched and, uh, you know, it seems like there was quite a few of you. We, we really appreciate you checking us out. Um, and we'll see you all next time. So thank you, Harvest. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you everybody who joined. See you soon. Bye. Bye.